My name is Masina Da Ferrara. Today I will present Seri Culture. This is the outline of my presentations, my own silk productions in the US. According to UNESCO, sericultures is a process of cultivating silkworm and extracting silk from them. Satoshi Takada also redefined that sericultures is an industry that is characterized by a two-step process. The first one is cultivations of mulberry trees. The other is the rearing of silkworms on mulberry leaves to produce cocoons. Silk was produced in China and introduced to the Roman Empire through silk roads during the first centuries. Knowledge about silk productions is very valuable. The Chinese emperor tried to keep it secret, but it did eventually spread beyond China, first to India and in Japan, then to the Persian Empire, and finally to the West in the sixth centuries. Process of silk productions evolved through time, but thing that doesn't change is mulberry trees is always the best food for silkworm. Cultivations of mulberry leaves is the first step before start raising silkworm. Identify the mulberry trees. See how many trees you have. I have about five mulberry trees in the backyard. They're a different kind, but when you look closely, the shape are not the same, but they look really shiny on the top. This is more like to be white mulberries. White mulberries have different types in the US. White mulberry are from China. Now they are everywhere in different countries, including the US. The second process is about raising silkworm on mulberry leaves to produce cocoon. I learned silk productions from Michael Cook. He is the owner of Worm Spit website, and he has many years of experience of raising silkworm and real silk filaments from cocoons. My silk productions start in Oklahoma in 2020. I receive silkworm eggs from the professor in the local university in Oklahoma. When I receive a news that I will have about 500 eggs, I investigate my mulberry trees live in my backyard and see how many trees I have. Basically, if I have 500 eggs of silkworm, I need to have about five mulberry trees in my backyard. I also investigate around my area, my friend's house, to make sure I have enough mulberry leaves throughout the life cycle of, of the silkworm. Usually when you raise silkworm in the US, you don't grow mulberry trees. They're available in different areas. They're considered as invasive species. If you plan to grow mulberry from seeds, it would take 10 years before they're big enough to bear fruit and produce leaves with nutrition for silkworm. You can grow them from cutting. It will take about 80 days to a year before you start raising silkworm. I did not grow my mulberry trees. They're in my backyard. 
If the leaves are shiny and smooth on top, they're most likely to be white mulberry. If they're rough like a sandpaper, they're most likely to be red mulberry. A lot of white and red mulberry crossed in the US, so they have a lot of hybrid in the area as well. I learned mulberry tree leaves by using the photo or image reference from the US Department of Agriculture. Mulberry leaves will start to shoot out the young leaves. And that is the time to tell that you can start. Pull out the eggs from the refrigerator if you put them in there safe over the winter, or if you order the eggs from local company in the US, they will start to hatch or emerge from the eggs within 10 days. The eggs color change to light color when they're ready or well, they're about to merge. You will see the black dot inside within the eggs. Mulberry leaves are daily picked in the morning, washed and dry before, sharp into small pieces like one centimeter by one centimeter to feed to the first stage and the second stage of silkworm. Silkworm have five different stages. Day one of the first stage is really critical. You should shop the small young leaves and leave it next to or close by. Don't put it on top of them because others do not hatch yet. You don't want them to grow more on them. I usually put them in different container if they emerge different day. Day one will stay together in one container. They're still small, so I can keep many hundreds in one container. You can see the pictures on the right. Silkworm day two grow very quickly and color change from dark color to brow, lighter color. Clean their beds every day is very important. To move them to the fresh food is the best to use. The knitting up is a technique that you put the net over the old food and put the fresh food on top. Silkworms will go up through the net and eat the leaves. And then you can move the net to the new area. I usually put papers under it to keep them dry and collect all the poop and easy to clean. The knitting up is a technique that I learned from Michael Cook to help me move a, a lot of silk, tiny little silkworm very quickly to the fresh and clean area. In day three, you can see the color change very quickly and they're visible now. It's easy to spot them. And if you, if you see them not moving at all, but they're up, their feet on the leaves, they're not on their back. It means they're still resting. This is the second stage. It's about seven days after they emerge from their eggs. They still eat cut leaves. And a lot of them is really active before they mold and move to the next stage. Third stage can eat a whole leaves. You don't have to shop anymore. I keep the same age of silkworm in the same container so that I can observe how they're doing. And if I see the smaller silkworm, I tend to move them to other containers because the 
bigger or older silkworms tend to eat faster and the little one tend not to have enough to eat. So I separate them as you see here. If you see them resting upright like this, they're okay. They're getting ready to mow again. And you can see their skin after they mold and they will rest for a while. At this stage, try not to pile the food on top of them. If you worry about them, you can put the food around the edge. So if they want to eat, they can move out and look for food. But usually when they before the mold or after the mold, they don't really eat. You will waste the leaf. But if you would like to put in there, that's okay too, but don't put on top of them. The fourth stage, they prefer to eat the whole branch. They really like to climb up and lay down on the branch. So I cut the young branch in there with the whole leaves. This is how I prepare my mulberry leaves for my silkworm. I soak them, clean them very quickly and dry them, sort through. I don't give them fruit. I picked only the leaves and give it to my silkworm. I prepare from six o'clock in the morning and keep going until midnight. They eat and rest throughout the day. So I break down to five times. Early in the morning, I finish feeding all of them. Last two years, I raised about 1,700 silkworm. So it takes times for me to, to feed them all. After I finish feeding in the morning, I will prepare the next meal for them before lunch. I will eat lunch and then feed them. After they eat, they will rest. Then I, they will get ready to eat again early afternoon, like 3 or 4 p.m. And then I'll prepare again after my dinner. They will eat again from 6. Before they go to bed, I put extra food in the container so that way they can have it before they go to bed or when they get up in the morning. I wash them because my house near the main streets have a lot of dust on the leaves. So I just want to make sure that I clean them and dry them and give it to my silkworm. This is the last stage. This stage, they'll eat a lot constantly. It's best not to leave the containers empty. They just Try to make sure they have plenty of food at this stage. They will be in this stage about seven days. I prepare the food during the day. If I have extra time, I will save the fresh leaves. I will have a lot of them put in a Ziploc bag and put in the refrigerator. As you can see, the last stage, some of them big, like three inches long and then they will eat a lot and you can hear when they walk on the leaves you will hear they're moving around this is the leaves in my backyard that I have when it's final stage I will cut like a lot of branches down and strip a lot of leaves put in the ice chest put in a refrigerator to make sure they have enough all day. And every morning I will clean the bed. I use recycled paper, put the bottom, put the nets on there. And in the morning I will lift the nets up and then put the clean paper down first. Before I move them back to their bed, I will put the nets on top of them first and put the fresh leaf on top so they can move up away from those dry branches. And then when they move to the new fresh leaves, I move them back in the container. When they're ready 
to spend. Some of them will poop and pee and clean up so they will look translucent like this. So you can see that these not just have a lot of wave around the silkworm, you can see the color. So that means they're ready to spin. You don't leave them in their bed like that because it's not suitable to be there. It might, the cocoon might get dirty and it's not enough space for them to spin the cocoon in their bed. So if I see that they're ready to spin, I will move them to the clean, dry space. I collect a lot of the paper roll like this and some of my friends send and help to support my activities. I count them from day one and monitor, make sure they're okay. And at the end, I, I want to know how many paper rolls I need to prepare for them. At the time, I have about 500, so I cut them in half, so I have a 1,000, and then reuse them when the first group complete their spinning. I can take the cocoon out and put the new silkworm in. I have two years experience of preparing the space for, for silkworms who spin the cocoon. It's best to leave them in the private area, close them so the cocoon will come out, perfect shape. If you leave them out, they will move around and sometimes they will stay together and spin the cocoon together. And that is really hard to reel the silk if the cocoon is our shape or too big, it's odd shape because they stay together. So it's best to isolate them, put them in a private area. I close them in the area here. When I pick them out from their bed, I know they're ready, but I didn't have enough time to close all of them at once. So this is more like a resting area for them. If they can wait for me, that's great. If they're not, they start spinning cocoon in there, that's okay too. What I did is to make sure they will start spinning. And then I will cut a piece of paper to close the top and close at the bottom. The main reason is if they pee and poop, they won't make a mess. And I need to stack them on top of each other to make sure I have enough space. Then close the top at the bottom is the best choice for me. And then I mark the date on top so I know when to expect the finish spinning. They usually take about six days to complete spinning their cocoon. After you know that's complete their spinning, you can take them out. I usually pull the silk around out, clean it up. It's called the first blade. I take it off so it helps my reeling process easier. Usually when you rest silkworm, you don't have them finished or emerged at the same time. They tend to have their own time. And this is the last two of 1,700. And you can see when they start getting ready to spin, you will have a lot of silk around them. And you can see that, okay, this is, they stop eating, they don't eat leaves anymore, and then they have the silk around them. This is a good sign is to say that they're ready to spin the cocoon. So I put them in a container, close it, the top and the bottom, mark the date, so I know when to expect them. Now, I have different uh, different experiments. I mark it white and red mulberry. That's my first year. I want to know if that's okay if they don't eat all white mulberry. What would happen if I raise them with the red mulberry or paper mulberry, which is I would not recommend you to do that because it's not good for silkworm. Most of them will die not healthy, not making good cocoon or die during spinning a cocoon. 
So the best of them will be white mulberry. If you can provide the white mulberry for your silkworm, that will be best. So I learned from Michael Cook how to check. If I want to breed them, want to have more eggs, I need to know which one is male and female. So what I learned is the, the large cocoon tend to be female and the medium size tend to be male. And to make sure not just the size of it, I need to cut and open. So I was trained to cut. So if you're not quite sure what you're doing, please do not do it. It's dangerous and you might hurt the pupa inside because this is a good um, good group that I would like to, to have moth. So I don't want to harm them. After I cut, I pull the pupa out gently and check their gender and put them back in there. So when the time come, 10 days after they start spinning, they will emerge. The rest that I did not pick for breeding program, I baked them to stop the process. I don't want them to come out as some moth. They all will ruin cocoon. So I stifle uh, the cocoon or bake them in my oven. Thirty minutes to forty minutes each time, and repeat a couple of times to make sure they all die and dry within the cocoon. And then I pack them in the in the bag, the cloth bag that you see there, so it's breathable. And I put in a bamboo basket until I have time to come back and reel them. In Thailand, they will reel the cocoon after they complete spinning. They have about four days window to put them in the hot water and start pulling silk filaments. So they were killed by hot water. And that is the best to get the best quality of silk filaments. But for us, that have full-time job might not be able to finish reeling everything within four days. And we don't have manpower to help each other to finish that. So stifle cocoon is a, a choice that you can keep your cocoon. Let's say as long as you have time, you can come back again during the summer or the break and reel them. Usually, I will spend about four hours to reel 50 cocoons. So I have 1,700 for 2021 and another 500 from 2020. I start working on it, but I still have 1,800 left to go. So it takes time for me to reel all of these. And another reason that I pause because I don't have good tools to reel the good quality of silk. To prepare the tools, it might take times. The next slide you will see that my handmade tools that I made. This is the process that how I pull the silk filaments from the cocoon. I heat up the water. When it starts to boil, I turn off the stove. And then put my cocoon, I usually start with 50, and put in the hot water. This is not traditional tool, but I used what I have in my kitchens to press and submerge the cocoon down under the water and leave it there for 15 minutes. And then I move the pot from the stove. Keep it warm and continue to, to pull them out. I use a brush to push and pull them up 
and then start to pull the filaments up together, as you see here. The process of silk railing, that's very simple. I pull it out. This method, I learned that it's good, but the quality of silk filament can be better than this if I use the right tool. I usually continue reeling until I see the pupa appear. So this means unravel all the way. And then I will add more cocoon. So the thickness of my silk filaments will be even. It's really thin. If it's only one filament from one cocoon, it's easy to break. So you need to gather them together more than 15. And then when you finish, let it dry. I usually type the, the end of the thread and the beginning together. Twist multiple threads together. It's make my silk filament thicker. After I finish, double them or twist them together. I usually measure them. See how long after I twist them. And then I put them on to my uh, tools, as you can see here. And then I use the finger A tight and keep my skin in place before I take them off. Silk filaments is from one cocoon is about three denier. And then if I pull them out 15 cocoon at the same time, so I know that the thickness of my filaments is about 45 deniers. And that is only the outer part. When it gets torsed to, to the inner part, it get thinner. It could be two denier or one denier. So keep that in mind. It's the number of the cocoon that you gather together will affect the dimensions of your thread. If you plan to, to weave or to braid, like me, I prepare silk for finger loop braiding. So I want to make sure that the filament is thick enough. The silk, when you pull or it extracts from the cocoon, they have gum coated, so it's not really soft. The process that I'm doing here is called degumming. I heat up the water, so I soak my silk skin in there for 30 minutes. This process will remove the serines or silk gum and make the silk soft. As you can see here, the left, that's before degum, and the right is after. It's shined and it's brighter. And that's ready for you to move to the next step is to dye your silk. This silk I sent to my friend. She dyed it for me because I want really deep red. And it's really hard to achieve. So I sent this silk to my friends to dye it and then she sent it back for me to braid it. So I braid it with the finger loop technique to put it together for, for me to use it for my elevation. So this silk is from my cocoon. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can contact me through my Facebook. My name is Masina da Ferrara on my Facebook. You can send me the message. I'll do my best to answer your questions.